thank you very much for the invitation. So I was asked to uh, give a talk called, What is a Genetic Polymorphism? So uh, these are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to what I'll be speaking about. Perhaps more relevant is that my area of expertise is heart failure. So one could say my relationship to urine output is quite different from most people in the room. So what's a SNP? Is it a hip hop artist? An hybrid car? One of the Rice Krispie characters, SNP, Crackle, and Pop. Or D, the abbreviation for single nucleotide polymorphism. If you answered C, this talk is for you. Okay, so if we would see an ad by Calvin Klein with everybody wearing the same size suit, we would probably think it doesn't make sense. Uh, unfortunately, clinically, when we select a drug or drug dosage, a lot of the time we're using a similar approach with many drugs having just one or two doses. So the plan of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about, uh, introduce uh, what is pharmacogenomics, why we, should, why we think pharmacogenomics could be useful, and uh, then give a quick genetics 101 uh, class or short lecture to really set the stage for the other speakers. So what is pharmacogenomics? Well, uh, basically, it's the study of how genetic variation can influence the response to drug. And so, uh, in other words, it really goes to try and identify genetic factors that can identify individual that would not have a good response to a drug, so either have uh, uh, non-effectiveness of a drug, have an adverse drug reaction, or individual that could require different dosage that the usual ones use, and target these patients and then treat them more appropriately than using the uh, more commonly used approaches. Why do we think we need that? Well, as a clinician, you all know that uh, patients res uh, respond much differently to drugs. What does this mean? Well, uh, first of all, it means that some of our patients will be more likely to develop adverse drug reaction. Uh, in Canada, uh, it is estimated that adverse drug reactions are responsible for 2,000 deaths per year and that uh, these are responsible for 7.5% of hospitalization. There's not that much uh, information out there are on the cost of drug ineffectiveness, although we know some drugs are not effective in patients, but just the cost of prescription drugs in Canada each year is $22 billion, and this is increasing year after year after year. So if we would even identify a small proportion of patients who should not be treated with, with a given drug, this could reduce cost. Now, an important uh, prerequisite behind the idea of pharmacogenomics is that actually the irritability of drug response has been demonstrated for some drugs, and that many genetic polymorphisms are known to influence uh, the expression of, for example, isoenzymes that, uh, common, that commonly metabolize drugs. Now, pharmacogenomics is an example of complex genetics, uh, whether, uh, which means that it is uh, the traits we observe, such as, for example, drug efficacy or allergic reaction, are generally the uh, combination of multiple genetic factors or, and environmental factors. Uh, as uh, environmental factors, we can think about diet or some life habits, such as smoking. And then, uh, in uh, regards to genetics, really, they can be related to the multiple uh, component of drug response. It, it, these can be related to the metabolism of drugs, as we see here, cytochrome uh, CYP2D6, which metabolizes a large proportion of drugs. They could be related to the target of a drug. Uh, here I use the example of the VCORC1 gene, which is uh, probably the most studied example in pharmacogenomics. Uh, that's the target of warfarin. You could also say that uh, genetic risk factors of a disease could modulate the response to a drug. And finally, uh, many adverse um, uh, hypersensitivity reactions have been identified and related to genetics factors related to the HLA complex, among those uh, allopurinol, um, phenytoin, carbamazepine, which are commonly used. So uh, why should we uh, 
care at this point about pharmacogenetics. We were just having a discussion before the talk that drug companies are already offering these tests. Uh, this is an example of a Canadian company in which you can go and they'll, they'll gladly do uh, genotyping for cytochrome P450 uh, mutation. Now, as you might expect, a uh, patient are going to come and uh, discuss this with you afterwards. We did a survey uh, which was published earlier this year um, of healthy individuals, uh, heart transplant patient and heart failure patient. And when asked uh, who they wanted their results to go to, the number one answer was, and in almost 100% their physicians, followed closely by pharmacists and nurses. So eventually, when uh, individuals start getting these tests, they will come to you uh, to get advice on how this impacts their, uh, or how it should impact uh, their, their treatment. So uh, a few basic si uh, statistics. Uh, you may, we probably know that uh, we all have 23 pairs of chromosome pairs because one comes from your mother, one your father, 22 pairs of autosome and one pair of sex chromosome. Uh, in our, uh, our, our genome is made of approximately 25,000 genes, which code for 100,000 proteins. And the basic code for uh, these genes are the, ba the four base pair, which are uh, in an excess of three billion in the, in the gene code. And these are the, as you may remember for your basic uh, biochemistry classes, adenine, smin, cytosine, and uh, guanine. And even though they're similar, uh, our genetic profile, everybody in this room is similar up to 99.9%, .9%, given the fact that this 0.1% is out of three billion uh, uh, base pair, well, it, uh, it explains the important uh, phenotypic or the difference in the traits we observe uh, both clinically and um, uh, in, in uh, everyday life. So you'll uh, probably also remember, and this is going to be a, a really quick discussion, that, that the majority of this DNA information is located in the nucleus of uh, our cells, and that this leads to uh, the transcription in mRNA, which ultimately is translated in uh, ribosome to make up a chain of uh, amino acids. So the DNA, and then ultimately the mRNA, contains the codes uh, which decides which amino acids will be part of the protein. And you obviously thus understand that any changes in this uh, sequence can lead to changes in the uh, protein. I'm sure a term that will be used after this is that when you have, for example, a genetic variation at a given point or um, in the genome, we'll see that an individual is carrier of a uh, different allele than an other individual. So in the case, for example, that the majority of individual or the wild type for uh, at a, a given loci or re, uh, location in the uh, genome is a C or citizen, we'll see that the mutation is a uh, or the variation is to a, a G, is a, a guanine polymorphism. And so uh, an ideal is uh, one version. The term genotype is used, uh, refers to when we discuss both alleles uh, in, in the particular individual. So for the example I gave earlier, you could say that an individual is either a CC carrier, a CG carrier, or a GG carrier. And this goes back to uh, uh, the example I just uh, used, as well as the first question or the question related to the presentation, which was, what is a single nucleotide polymorphism? Well, it is the uh, uh, single base pair change in the uh, genome, as we see here, the G to C variation. We estimate, uh, using dbSNP, which is a database of genetic variation, that there's about 150, 000, uh, 150 million genetic variation in the genome, some of them very frequent, others perhaps present in only a few or one uh, individual. And we'll actually use the term polymorphism only referencing to uh, ge uh, genetic variants which are present in at least 1% of the population. Otherwise, they're called a mutation. So you understand that depending on the population, a mutation can be a polymorphism in a, that, uh, another population uh, depending on the, the, its prevalence. 
This is generally the, 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 uh, the point in the presentation when some people start nodding off, so bear with me. I think I have five or six more slides. I just want to briefly go over uh, a few uh, examples of genetic uh, uh, variation that may be used, uh, may be discussed by the other speaker. One type is uh, uh, that we uh, well see sometimes it's called a frame shift muta mutation. Uh, earlier on, I discussed that uh, the mRNA is actually uh, responsible for um, identifying or, or um, uh, translating the information to the ribosome of what amino acid should be uh, next included in the uh, amino chain. You may remember that uh, this information comes in triplets of three. So if you have an inclusion of just one, and not just a variation, but an inclusion or a deletion of one base, then this completely changes the reading frame uh, in the uh, ribosome. So then uh, all the information that would be located after that insertion of dilution would lead to changes in all the following uh, amino acid. Uh, other types of mutation, uh, actually as many of those triplets or codon can lead to a similar amino acid, sometimes we'll have what, is, what are called silent mutations, saying that the change in the sequence does not have an impact on the amino acid sequence. Uh, other can lead to uh, a change in the amino acid sequence, but would not be anticipated to have a major impact on the function of the protein as some of these amino acids are biochemistry, uh, have a similar biochemistry uh, or similar biochemical effects. Now, what we believe are more problematic in uh, uh, clinical practice would be missense uh, mutation. These are variants, for example, that lead to a change in the uh, amino acid um, um, located at that particular uh, low, uh, that particular um, point in the protein, and then nonsense mutation, which leads to the a stop codon or that the protein the, the, is not uh, elongated anymore in the ribosome, so this leads to a non-functional protein. A good example would be, for example, a uh, variant in cytochrome uh, to, uh, CYP2D uh, C19, uh, star 3. So this is a particular variant, and, and thus individual carrying this uh, variant would be uh, expected to have higher concentration of drugs when they are metabolized uh, by that enzyme, or on the other end, for us uh, in cardiology with the clopidogrel, which is a prodrug, uh, not uh, d demonstrate any concentration of the active, of the active drug, uh, because the uh, the individual does not possess the enzyme to activate the drug. Um, Another uh, possibility that not necessarily related to the uh, um, amino acid sequence are genetic variation that can occur in the promoter region. So obviously uh, the, the, pr the promoter um, is the region where all the transcription factors bind. So this can lead to an important changes uh, in the expression of the gene. And another possibility we frequently see are splicing variants. Splicing is the uh, process by which non-coding mRNA uh, is um, removed from the immature mRNA to the mature mRNA. And uh, one that variant that could be of interest for many drugs used to treat uh, incontinence uh, is cytochrome P453A5. Now, um, most Caucasians don't express cytochrome uh, 3A5, uh, and this could explain uh, perhaps interracial um, response to, to many drugs because um, uh, African American uh, expressed an approximately 40 to 45 percent of individual that enzyme, and so uh, historically, the importance of, of CYP3A5 was uh, um, not well known because it is really similar to CYP3A4, uh, and the substrates of both enzymes are quite similar. Uh, but uh, that uh, clinically, at least, uh, in, when we use um, uh, immunosuppression, such as tacrolimus, we see a big difference in dosing requirement. 
Uh, and perhaps uh, related to pharmacogenetic, one type of uh, genetic variation that's uh, quite important are uh, deletion or duplication of genes. In particular, cytochrome P452D6, it has been reported in some population or in some families that uh, some individual could carry 13 functional genes of CYP2D6. So these individuals have uh, extreme um, ca metabolizing capacity for drugs that are metabolized by CYP2D6. Ultimately, uh, right now I discussed mainly uh, genetic variation related to the sequence of di uh, DNA, but uh, we now know that probably many other um, uh, genetic modification unrelated to the DNA sequence, such as uh, histone modification, DNA methylation, which can uh, suppress some uh, genetic variant, can modify the structure of a protein, could have an impact on genetic response, but that goes uh, beyond uh, what is currently uh, anywhere near uh, clinical application. So I'll, I'll limit the discussion to that. So in conclusion, the pharmacogenomics, personalized medicine, precision medicine, it's still at a rather early stage, uh, but I think that uh, education uh, will be a key factor in its implementation, so thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to open this up for a discussion. If anybody has any comments to make? Or maybe I can make one of my prepared comments. And that is, what kind of evidence would be required to translate PGX into practice? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, that is a, a, a matter of debate. I think we had, uh, with other experts, that uh, discussion a few days ago. Um, I think it may depend on the field. I would think that for common disease, such as cardiovascular disorder, we'll need some type of randomized study to show at least benefit on some surrogate endpoint. If I think of the number of people, for example, that receive statins before we go out and genotype everybody that's going to receive this treatment, I think for the healthcare system, uh, we'll need to justify the cost. Uh, in other areas, such as pediatrics, uh, or in the case of severe allergic reaction, we may not need uh, that much uh, information, but I think it's going to be necessary to, to uh, enable the paradigm change in clinical practice that this type of testing and uh, sharing of the information that's going to be required. Any other questions or comments on the subject? Simon, thank you very much. <laughs>